I think I've always wanted to create spaces, spaces that one can enter into, experiential spaces where one can both feel the materiality of them, experience the materiality of them. And this is really what I've always wanted to do and gradually I've become clearer about what I'm trying to say within that space. For me that content is very important. It enables me to engage with a living world, an organic changing world, with what I call the life world. I would say her work was engaged, passionate and lyrical. I mean she's got an extraordinary curiosity. She's, she's really open to all manner of new ideas. Uh, you didn't do any with hydrochloric acid, but I will. For as long as I can remember, she's worked with alchemy, and there's a fascination for the changing nature of material. I visit her studio is always just the most wonderful thing because all the stuff that's lying around within this, you know, beautiful, evanescent white space. Very early on, as an artist, I was fascinated by the transformation of matter and substances. I'm very interested in trying to um, almost preserve in a state of flux, in a state of becoming, that moment where one matter starts to transform into another. I love the idea of kind of almost um, freezing it in that state of becoming. Creating this space that becomes reflective, becomes a space of memory. Installation, I suppose, broadly speaking, um, which in some strange ways goes back to the Renaissance. It, it gets away from the kind of modernist thing of unique objects sitting on a white box or on the floor and goes back to the idea of an object in space uh, integrating and engaging with space and architecture. I mean, I think sitting outside Museum of Sydney with uh, Janet's inner forest is, um, is absolutely fabulous. Age of the Trees was an invited competition for the site of First Government House. I became really interested in the idea of the memory of the site. That is the botanical memory, the Eora memory, and the colonial memory. So I wanted to work with an Aboriginal artist for the Eora memory. And fortunately, being a museum, there was so much material to work with all the botanical and colonial memory. So the piece just became like a mapping of the site, a mapping of the memory of the site. The sandstone is the sandstone of Sydney that Sydney's built on. It's also the sandstone that the museum was built out of. And the sandstone the Aura people used to make their carvings into. And the, the wooden pillars are like the botanical memory because those big wooden pillars were once trees around that site that were carted off to form the first foundry. And I spent months looking for big, tall wooden pillars. And the extraordinary thing was, late one night I ran into someone who happened to be working on the site of the old winery and just happened to let me know about these. And so, of course, we claimed them for the museum as great historical, archaeological objects and split down the middle with reflective mirror in there and the voices calling the names of the Eora places. 
that existed around Sydney, like a type of sound map. Gungo. Gamai. Wana. Gungo. Palangalawu. Dubu Wagalia. Bayengawua. Gapa Gapa. Nora. Nora. Gurayagun. Gungo. I mean, I, I've judged quite a few of these things, and I must say, I've got, quite often walked into the room, and, um, and and they've all been reading the brief like mad to see whether they can tick off all the boxes. And I said, well, forget the brief. You know, this, let's pick the thing that's going to work in the space, that's going to be the most beautiful object for the for the site. And everybody, you know, the artists and so on, they just heave a sigh of relief because they've been told, you know, about this kind of idea that public art. It has to be about the history of the site. It has to very postmodern. You know, it has to be readable. You don't read art. You look at it. You know, and I think um, I mean, sure, it can draw on the history of the site, but more particularly the quality of the site as a space. Well, the Vale of Trees is in a site that, of course, had been denuded of all its its original trees and, and, and I think the idea there was to create, regenerate the space really with species that were growing there. And the idea of the glass pillars, holding within them kind of conscience of trees through the voice of poets. And the idea of bringing this linear passage of veils of glass, carrying seeds laminated into them, ash laminated into them. Scripted onto them are fragments of poems by Australian poets that are all very specifically about a very intimate experience of trees. And they're very powerful and very beautiful. And it was that idea of bringing you deeply within the consciousness of sort of trees. The idea of memory per se, I think, um, is enormously important in art in general. And, and this whole idea of veiling in Janet's work, I think, has something to do with memory. In the case of glass, with her, um, it's her substances that run down the glass that um, become traces of some imaginary process, organic or, or almost volcanic. Artists have this incredible ability to scratch the surface and really get to the heart of the matter quite often. And Janet is someone whose work very much engages with issues. You know, she's passionate about issues like urban planning and architecture, the environment, conservation, and so on. Uh, and I think it's often, again, not realised that artists do have that role to actually remind us of what's really going on or actually ask the awkward questions or step over the mark a little bit and push things into a different direction. I think it's a skill with light. The whole notion of transparency, translucency, solid, opaque versus clear, um, the presence and absence of materials and the presence and absence of weight and mass. And that, I think, is one of her great skills. As you say, reflection as well, colour, so that layers and layers and layers of colours and, and absences of colour. My favourite piece of Janie's, I would have to say, is the windows in the synagogue 
which I feel to be one of the great religious artworks of the, of the century. The 49 veils are 49 veils of glass, which make up the four worlds of the Kabbalah with the symbolic colours that are given in the Kabbalah. Once she's caught you in her space, she's wanting to, to veil you, to hold you in that space. And that led to one of the most exciting projects I've ever done, which was a, a work called Still Lives, which is the showcases for the Melbourne Museum. I think she's an artist on a mission to really uh, keep, keep us aware that we're living in a fragile world. In the way that only an artist can, Janet gave us something in this project that we at OCA didn't even know we needed. We actually asked for a monumental artwork to celebrate the southern end of the boulevard. And in her own classic way, Janet said, no, you guys don't need a big monument for the end of Olympic Boulevard. This place is just dotted with gigantic architectural forms. What you need down here is a magic space, an intimate space. You win the competition, sort of, you know, which is on the one hand cause for celebration, but it's also a bit of cause for alarm because, my God, this kind of fairly extreme thing you've designed, which is totally about an idea, it's just the concept, suddenly has to be built. On a conceptual level, I want to create an environment which reveals, like an X-ray, the process of water remediation as a metaphor for the transformation that is happening on the Homebush Bay Olympic site. This is an area that was once a degraded post-industrial toxic site that is now being transformed into a green living space. Um, this is our uh, toxicity testing. Oh. Um, now, I don't know a lot about it, but they use... Um... My piece did involve a lot of research into the purification of water. And what's the um, other green thing? That's just um, actually just a synthetic. That's actually a biofilter for the aquarium. Oh, right. Well, research gives me uh, uh, that things are based on um, facts, but from the fact I can um, evolve a kind of poetic about it or I can, I can abstract it slightly, but it gives me something to work from. I'd never sort of seen water purification happening. I mean, I think what's really interesting is that water is the most important thing in our life, for our livelihood, and we know so little about it. And I think it's fascinating to think that all the water that we're using and drinking is going through this incredible kind of transformative process to, to purify it.
I guess going to both those, those um, plants gave me some extraordinary visual imagery to have in my own mind. It makes you realise that they need to be quite tall, don't you think? When you sit, when when there's no caterinas there. Is this all contaminated? Do you think? I don't know. <laughs> Could be. The um. Great. We shouldn't go near it <laughs> because the highest we can go today, I think, is four meters. Yeah. Okay. We just have to imagine. We have to imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Working with Jasuk Han. The mock-up was important to establish how tall the wands needed to be to relate to the massive bridges they were about to build. I hope, I hope 21 wands will be enough, but I hope. But there's a possibility we may need more. <laughs> this is like a comedy. This is so funny watching them. Look, look, there you go. Yay! Woohoo! Finally, only weeks before the Olympics, we began installation. driving um, exercise to because if that crane just suddenly moved it could knock the wand and break it so it's just this material it's a little bit it, it's unknown you know we've been assured of its strength it looks very very fragile I mean I like the fact that it does look so fragile but I think I don't really know how fragile it really is they're moving in the wind now you know Anyway, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. It's always very hard to sort of say, where's my work going to go? I certainly have dreams for my work, and sometimes you get extraordinary opportunities that you never imagined. We've reached a new stage now, I think, where there is a team of artists out there in Australia, um, often working with quite uh, particularly with given architects, uh, and they know, they know how to work together, and they're getting it, their act together. So we're seeing some very good projects. I think artists and architects working together is a very interesting uh, situation because the artist does bring a very different way of looking at the world from an architect, in my experience. Uh, architects are also artists in their own right, but the way that the artist can join a team, approach a problem, um, look at it from a, a new angle and, and push it in a different direction. I spend a lot of time with artists. It never ceases to amaze me how they really do see the world differently. In 2003 we did the Australian War Memorial in London which was a very major work and again Jenny was you know crucial at the concept stage and both of us agreed quite strongly on what the iconography and, and feel of the memorial would be and it wasn't until I actually went to the site during the competition that it became clear that some of our earlier ideas which had, had relied on a much more kind of fragile presence and, and more diaphanous layering, if you like, would be completely inappropriate in a harsh urban environment. A huge arc of a wall that rises from the ground in height up to about three metres. It's a wall of intermittent falling water all along it. Right through the centre of this whole wall of green granite are 
28,000 names of places where all the soldiers who were killed in battle in the first two world wars came from, places in England and places in Australia. I must be somehow steering it in the in a direction that I, I certainly wanted to go because one thing seems to lead to another. I'm very fortunate to be working on a most ex extraordinary new building in Melbourne, which is going to be the exemplary green building called CH2. Well, it's pretty exciting visiting this site. It's just, it, it's just, I think it's an extraordinary sort of site, an amazing building they're doing here, and it's very, very exciting philosophy behind it. And I hope it does set an example to buildings, you know, in Australia. About um, using, reusing uh, rather ancient technologies that respond to nature, um, where mining water from the sewer, we're using uh, the wind, we're using the sun, and we're using the climate, uh, the Melbourne climate, as an opportunity rather than a problem. Unlike a modern building which doesn't bother with nature, uh, tends to operate independently of nature, this one has to work with nature. So we store up cold energy um, when it gets cold and use that to um, bring down the temperature when it gets too hot. So we're using water to, to cool the building but in, a, in an indirect way. There are a lot of other um, ways in which we've increased the efficiency of, of cooling in the building and we're going to save 83% electrical load and about 92% gas load on the building. CH2 is the world's greenest building. It has a six-star energy rating. It's been built by us to house the staff of the city. Janet Lawrence is doing a key piece for our foyer. It's called Watervale, and it's a, a major piece which will greet all visitors to the building as they enter. Each of these long panels that they're carrying in now represent the elements that are taken out of the water in the purification process from black water. I've tried to represent them in the colours I imagine they are in their watery world. We've been so abusive of water but finally we've come to our senses and realised that in actual fact we have to realise its preciousness. And I mean, this building's so extraordinary um, for what it is recycling, recycling all its water and sewerage and using 72% of the water, I, I believe, that it uses will be recycled water. All the water except that, that, that that's drunk will be recycled water. What does the lettering tell us? Well, basically, they're the chemical elements that are taken out of the water during the filtration process all the different elements and, you know, that, that are in the sewerage water and that then have to be extracted through the various processes that it goes through. Most cities in the world recycle water. London recycles all the water seven times at least and mixes it with fresh water. But what Janet has done here is to show she, she's fascinated by the process of, of uh, filtering water. And she's drawing attention to the way in which science works. It's a pretty fantastic thing that the building's doing. And this is like a water chemistry wall. You know, I call it Water Vale. Water Vale was the working title that in the end it stayed that way. And it is very much like a watery veil, I think. All of this is, is 
about the magic substance water. Water is, is more than just H2O, it's, it's the source of life. Tremendously important. Is it, it's important. I mean, life on the planet depends on water, sun, um, together, not just, just sun. I can't tell really if it's bad, better. Uh, I think it'll, pro it'll probably be okay. Well, it's going to go up. Thank you very much. The degrees of transparency are so hard to gauge. It's, it's, it's impossible from all the prototypes I had to ever work that out. And of course it just changes from hour to hour. She's taken on very tricky things, like environmental issues, um, and tried to make not just things that image environmental issues, but actually, you know, trying to work with buildings that actually will address environmental issues. I mean, you'd always recognise a Janet Lawrence. 